was delighted with him. He was so well written, the characters were so great, and he had managed to bring all these different arenas together. Action horror movies still deal with the issues of our soul and the possibility of mortality or immortality. They deal with the fears and the hopes for life after death. Uh, they deal with the possibility of final judgment. I come back to bring you the wisdom of the grave. Will you hear it? Yeah. I've always said that horror movies and indeed horror fiction is one of the few places left where we can talk like theologians where we can use the vocabulary of the pulpit without embarrassment. Are you a believer then? Oh yeah, I've signed on for all of them in my time. Catholic, Hindu, Moonies, can't have too many saviors. It seems to me to be a, a sort of perverse form of religious fiction.
I mean, when we were taking the movie out, and I can say this now because the movie, you've, you've been through this whole hoopla, you know, but um, when we were taking out the movie in, in August, I knew that there was a better version of the movie after that. And that is so damn frustrating, it really is. It's like being in a beauty contest, you know, with, you know, a patch over one eye and a tattoo on your bottom. I mean, it feels, like, it feels like you're not actually presenting your best face to the world. Um, so that, I hope, explains why, you know, the, the word pressures there. Now, interesting thing has happened. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the movie was, last week, was the most rented movie in the country. Yes. Uh, sold a lot of them to the stores and when it comes out uh, available for, for sale, which it will later in the year, uh, hopefully we will have another audience coming to find it. The, the long version will be playing on Showtime, not the short version, the director's cut will be on Showtime. So there will be lots of people who will be getting to see the right version of the movie. Interestingly, I'm now uh, telling United Artists that they should release the director's cut in Europe. Uh, it, should be, it should be a great event, um, uh, because one of the interesting things about the presence of the World Wide Net is that most people now know there was a director's cut out there. Uh, there are people around the country, around the world rather, who know that there is a better version. And I think it will be very tough for United Artists to take out the short version and put it into markets where people know that there is a director's cut. I think it will be a very tough thing for them. And I'd like to think that this will change the way that directors and projects are, are, are treated. I think it would be very nice to feel that in future people trusted, that people in studios trusted people like myself, because I think everybody who's seen both versions of the movie knows that the director's cut is the right version. So that's that for, why don't we have some questions from the floor? This, this, yes, there's somebody in the back. I know there's somebody with right sticks. Yes, sure. Who Sounds has the right like sticks there? Well, I will follow the lady with the bright sticks. I want to give you the microphone. Please speak into it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Mr. Barker, hi. Um, hi. Not to be facetious, but I completely agree with what you're saying. But wouldn't there be some concern if a company like United Artists would now feel they couldn't trust their market by testing the product? and they wouldn't be able to test, uh, trust the results from their test market? You know, one of the, that's a good question, but one of the most successful pictures in terms of tests uh, ever was a movie called Inner Space, a very nice movie by Joe Dante, which failed miserably at the box office. Uh, there is no way of using these kind of tests for, as a definitive way, and I stress definitive way, of, of uh, deciding what's going to work and what isn't going to work in the marketplace. Um, you may, for instance, decide that Lord of Illusions is a, maybe a darker piece of movie making than you would thought because that's the way the audience responds. You may decide that there's a couple of unintentional laughs because you showed it to an audience and they, you know, they had a response they shouldn't have had. Um, you may decide that there are a couple of places where an audience says, you know, that's too gross for me, I, don't, I just don't want to see that. And you might make, you may make trims accordingly. But to actually come to a filmmaker and say, this script which we say yes to is 12 minutes of dialogue too long, uh, is not, I think, a way to make anything. Uh, the truth of the matter is, stories are told by individuals, they're not told by groups. They're told to groups by individuals. Um, art is made by individuals. Uh, a vision is had by somebody, in this particular case me, and you either decide to back the vision or you decide not to back the vision. Um, I don't think any, any art of any value was ever made democratically. You see what I mean? I just don't think you can do it that way. Hi, Clyde. Hi. Um, I've been a fan of yours for a long, long time now, and um, it's the magic that started it off for me. I was just amazed and just drifted off into parallel you. universes and all this. It was incredible. My dad is also a big fan and wants to know when are you bringing out your next book? 
Well, I shouldn't be here because um, I have I have three days to deliver. I, I am three days from delivering my next novel, and so I'm sitting here thinking about the sentence, literally the sentence I left half an hour's drive from here, uh, sitting on my desk. Um, it's full sacrament. It uh, I delivered two thirds of it. The final third will be delivered this Friday. And it's a 500 page book um, about um, a wildlife photographer who uh, encounters a man and a woman whose business it, business it is to drive species to extinction. And also, have you any idea? It's, it's, a, you know, it's a comedy. <laughs> Have you any idea when we will be getting a load of illusions in England? Uh, in England, I'm still waiting on that, in part because of the conversation we just had. Um, I uh, want them to release the director's cut in England. Yes, so that, good. And have you seen the, the director's cut? Have you seen? No, but I'll see it next week. I'm still in the week. Excellent, good. Uh, the, uh, the, prob the, there you go. the problem is, here's an interesting fiscal problem the United Artists have. In Europe, what happens is that European audiences get American prints. So what happens is an American audience sees them, that's why in Europe you usually get a movie three, four, six months later than the American audience. Now, all the prints that are here that went out into the world were the short versions. So now the, the English distributors are saying, well, um, we have to strike new prints for the director's cut. And what I'm saying is, I would prefer you only put out three prints in England, and it was the director's cut. Then you put out 50, and it was not the director's cut. So I'm waiting on an answer from on that. Thank you. Where's the lady with the light? There she is. The Florence Nightingale of this gathering. <laughs> yeah, Clive, I was wondering, um, the big question is, is there going to be another Lord of Illusions? And then with your upcoming fourth edition of Hellraiser 4, is there going to be more of those two? Or uh, more? God, I hope not. We have a script for, for another Harry de Moore picture. And... Um, the question is going to be, I think, the, the question is twofold, really. Uh, firstly, whether Mr. Bakula wants to do it, and at this point we haven't come to any terms on that, though I would passionately hope he does. And the second thing is whether that becomes something which goes on to a showtime and then goes on to video, or whether it goes theatrically. At the moment, what we're looking at is maybe doing something which goes uh, onto Showtime or HBO, where you have as much freedom as you do theatrically, um, and then goes straight to video or laser. I'm increasingly of the belief that, I don't know how interested you are in what's happening in the economics of movie making right now, but last um, autumn was a calamitous time for some movies, huge movies that cost 50 and 60 million dollars, Jade and Strange Days and a Scarlet Letter, thank you, disappeared without trace. They made very, very small amounts of money. And actually, you know, one of those, one and a half of them weren't bad movies. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's things, movies, movies just disappear without trace these days. And my argument is, well, to myself is, well, do I want to make movies that have a theatrical life and maybe they're on the screen for two or three weeks? And I have to deal with the nonsense that we were just talking about. Or do I go and make a movie for Showtime or HBO where I'm left completely alone? And the movie finds its way to as, as large an audience, because that audience is now huge. Uh, and I'm balancing those things off right now. Um, the, the success of the movie on video is which is where we always knew it would be most successful, frankly, because that's where these kind of movies are successful, uh, uh, is a huge argument for the sequel. The sequel is tremendous, a tremendous script, not by me, my idea, but not my uh, execution, a really wonderful movie. I'd love to see it made. As far as Hellraiser from the Man with the bad acupuncture problem. Uh, uh, it opens, I guess, in two weeks' time or something like that. 
not half bad little movie. I'm quite quite pleased with it. Um, you know, again, I'm very distant from it, but you know, it's my baby tottering off into um, into the future, and I feel as though if it stopped now, that would be the best thing. Certainly, if there was another Hellraiser movie, I wouldn't have anything to do with it. I just feel. I'm over it, you know? <laughs> um, there's only so much you can give to those things, and, uh, you know, it, I'm surprised that we've got as far down the line as we have with the Hellraiser movies, to be perfectly honest. I'm much more interested in the, the more character-driven kind of stuff that Lord of Illusions represents. Now, it is still an effects movie. It's still got a lot of jumps and scares and all those things in, but it's a much more, again, particularly in the director's cut, a much more <laughs> cogent, character-driven piece of work. And the Hellraiser movies have never been character-driven. They've been, you know, <laughs> spurting artery-driven. <laughs> and, 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 you know, there is a huge, there's a huge audience for that, mainly behind bars. <laughs> Five adjectives would you use to describe yourself as a filmmaker and a writer? Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, obsessed. Um, intense. Um, sensual. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> it's Sunday. Uh, um, here's a big one, metaphysical. Um, dirty minded, oh is that the word? <laughs> oh, that's the wrong word, dirty minded is okay? Good. Good question. Hi. Hi. I was wondering if it does get to the third Harry Moore picture, I'd like to make a strong suggestion to the New Orleans area. I know you've done films in that area before. I love New Orleans. And we'd love to see you carry in New Orleans. You know what? We when we were, when we first talked about a sequel, I said we should go do that. And I did Candyman too mm -hmm. there. And it seemed a little too close for comfort. But yes, and Rice Territory, Voodoo. We actually I think there's some wonderful stuff we could do down there. It's also a short drive for me. There <laughs> ulterior motives. Yeah. Okay, this is some, uh, a question. I thought you might be interested in some feedback. My name is Margaret Colton. I work with the Project Ronald at Fan Club, and I'm in touch with a lot of the people. And I got some interesting feedback. Is Donna Dickinson here somewhere? Donna Dickinson, way at the back. She discovered this interesting fact first in New York, and I confirmed it from where I live and from other places. The blockbuster chain in the franchises, they carried only the R-rated version, in the corporate stores, they carry the director's cut. And if this one, Can you give me a, de a definition of what the franchise... Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. That's I all see. I know. Corporate is owned by the chain. Gotcha. The franchise would be something that's owned locally. Do you know what percentage one is to the other? I mean, are the more... As near as I can tell, and this is a just curious. Yeah. about eight director's cut to two uh, R-rated versions, the theatrical versions. The mom and pop is, stores mostly yeah. had the director's cut. Who has a question down here? Uh, most other places seem to have the director's cut. The I, can, I can give you some explanation for that. Please, um, the the uh, director's cut is um, contains 31 seconds or thereabouts of material which is was beyond the pale as far as the MPAA was concerned. In other words, when we construct, when we reconstructed the movie containing my director's material, he also put back the stuff the MPAA took out, which means that it's an unrated movie. Now, for some people in some areas, particularly in the South, interestingly, the term <laughs> unrated is a real problem. I can hear you. Now, I think some of it is a moral judgment. Now, we can, jo we can joke about this, but there are lots of people who say, oh, it's an unrated movie. It contains 15 or 30 seconds of material that 
MPAA said that America should not see, um, and Pat Buchanan certainly should not see. <laughs> so we have to keep it for the There is, a, there is, it's a non, it's a nonsense. But thank you for pointing that out. Um, what's interesting is that the blockbuster uh, had the courage to carry the director's cut any place because they are a very conservative company. Yeah. Yes. Oh, when you talk Stand about up. when you talk about Lord of Illusions two, do you mean a continuation of Lord of Illusions one with the same? Story or a brand new story for Harry? A new story. Um, one of the things I've done over the years, I've been writing about Harry as a character now for uh, for ten years, and he has encountered a lot of strange things in novels and short stories. And so part of this is uh, going in and and taking him on a fresh adventure. One of the fun things about him as a character, I think, is that he is humane, funny accessible, sexy, all those things that you want in a hero. And by and large, and I've said this before, horror movies and dark supernatural movies are driven by their villains. When you think about horror movies, you think about the villain. You think about Pinhead, you think about the Candyman, you think about Freddy Krueger, you think about Pazuzu possessing, you know, poor little Linda Blair. Uh, you, you don't think about um, the good guys. And what I tried to do with this movie was make a movie where you actually cared about the good guy, you know? And so forget, you know, Nix is gone, all those guys are gone, never to be seen again. I don't want to have that thing of, uh-oh, the monster's back, you know, they pulled out the stake, you know, it's, it's that stuff. I want to move on, take the story somewhere fresh. And hopefully, if the series can continue with some regularity, maybe develop um, the idea of, of, of an emotional arc for Harry. It, which has certainly occurred in the books, so that as we live with Harry, as it were, from story to story, we understand him better. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that happens at the end of World of Illusions is he walks off into a rather grim-looking future with Dorothea. Uh, you know, what's happened to Dorothea might indeed be an element in in the, the next picture, not that Dorothea would be, but you know, just to finish off that part of the story, a little piece of connective tissue. But otherwise, it would be a completely fresh story, and I think that's part of the fun of it. Dry standing concert where they really put the screws to the little guys and have the extra footage put in so that they were forced to go if they wanted to see the whole thing. I think it's capitalism 101 that you screw yes. the little guy. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, and they're notorious for it. I never thought about that before, but I think that's a completely legitimate yeah. reading of it. Wait, completely. Wait, oh. Ah, well, now oh. that's interesting because here, the, the, the corporate stores have the director's cut. That's right. The no, corporate stores have yes. the director's cut. So who doesn't? Oh. Got you. Yeah, right. Okay, well that would still be the little store. That would right. still they're, be the little guy. So your point is still half full. They're not making it available to the franchise. Yeah. I, I do think there's a piece of politics in there. I, yeah. I, I mean, who knows? I mean, who knows? Uh, all that I frankly care about in my, in my monomaniacal way is that as many people as possible get to see the version that they want, which is wherever I, whenever I can, I talk about that. Yes? Uh, yes, a good question. Um, for a conference or whatever, you had a few out a few years ago. Are you ever going to get a chance to do more of those in the future? Or? Comic books are a, a mess right now. Uh, nobody makes any money from comic books right now, unfortunately, and so getting people to actually make new ones is really tough. And so it's gone to the back of my head. I, in, in order of preference right now, I'm looking after the books, the movies, the paintings. At some point, maybe, maybe we'll get back into comic books, but it's not a high priority. Uh, yes, I, I hate to keep going back to the blockbuster. Let's go back to blockbuster. <laughs> Let's go back to blockbuster. Uh, and we've been, uh, they've had the director's cut at uh, Blockbuster in Orlando. The problem has been uh, they didn't foresee the amount of rentals 
that has been going on with that cut, so they underbought the number of tapes to put out there. And I know I tried for uh, almost two weeks steady every night, and they won't reserve it for you. Yeah. And I could not get it. It was it was gone as fast as it was coming. Now there's good news and bad news. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry it took you two weeks. I am. I think the message that will be sent out to United Artists is you got a hit. Yes. And that's yes. what that's what I really care about because that's about them making a sequel. You know, I mean that's that's what that impacts. Right. Um, I've heard the same story from a lot of people, so I assume that they underbought, and a lot of companies underbought, or stores underbought. I don't know why that is. I think if they, I think they underestimate Scott's appeal. That's the first thing. Yes. Yes. Um, I think they say TV. You know, I mean that's the that's the thing. Oh, he's a, he's a TV star. You know, and they don't see that. These things are happening, you know? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of very articulate, enthusiastic people who are great fans of his. So I think that's got a huge amount to do with them not understanding. Um, by and large, horror movies, if I can call it that, haven't been doing that well. And they have been taken by surprise, again, for the same reasons. They definitely undercalculated. I think it's a wonderful message to send out. Uh, when, you know, one of the things that, 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 one of the lists that's made up is the list of, of how regularly a movie is rented. In other words, the turnover of a movie. And last week, against much bigger movies, Waterworld and Jade, movies which cost orders of magnitude more than Lord of Illusions, we were the most rented movie. And that's got to say a huge amount about Mr. Bacchus' appeal. At the back, yes. Well, hi, Clyde. Hi. I'm Donna. I'm the one who started. Hi, Donna. You're responsible. <laughs> and uh, just to make a long story short, the franchise stores are in Westchester County, Connecticut. So to get the director's cut, I had to go over the border and to meet, smuggle it back. And you went over the border. <laughs> so, so, um, so your the band in Westchester County and Connecticut. Well, so. it, tell me, do you think anybody in those stores knew that they didn't have the definitive copy? Do you think they cared? Well, they cared when I found another unrated movie on the show. <laughs> <laughs> and they lost the business, yeah. Yes. I think, I think if you say to most people, uh, how many director's cuts of movies have you seen? There wouldn't be very many. Maybe they'd talk about Blade Runner, which they'd seen in the director's cut. Maybe they'd seen the director's cut of Aliens. But probably you could name the director's cuts that people have seen on the fingers of one hand. Well, it was a, it was definitely explained to me as a corporate policy type of thing. The it particular was. store said, well, we didn't think it was uh, appropriate to carry. Now, were you speaking to a little old lady wearing a cross on her forehead? No, I was speaking to someone making at most uh, $4 an hour. Kind of, well, this is the corporate policy and da 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 da. I was, making, I was making a joke about little old ladies and crosses, but I do know that in some places the absence of the director's cut is a Christian choice. Well, it, it, it is up there too, because I said this was definitely not a movie that they would consider carrying. I have to tell you, because this is, this is tangential, but I can be entertaining. You know that in the summer, uh, the Catholic Church started to rate movies. I don't know if you're aware of this. You can actually dial, and they will tell you. <laughs> oh no, it's quite seriously. They will tell you, you know, is it suitable for none? Is it, you know, is, is it suitable for nuns, lesbian lover? Is it, you know, is it suitable? And, and, uh, it, and this began, I think, two weeks before a lot of illusions came out. And somebody called up and said, you've just been banned by the Catholic Church. Uh, we, were, we were the only movie, and there were a whole bunch of much, much more violent movies out there. Desperado was one of them, where the body count was huge. It didn't matter. We, we troubled the Pope.
I don't know. I, I, I dialed it and I just put a lot of heavy yeah. breathing. So. Well, in fact, they've been writing movies for years. It's just obviously it sounds like they've decided to they've actually off. They've actually gone high tech and you can actually get, you know, this is unsuitable or they have four or five ratings from the sacred to the obscene. Yeah, so they're just putting a little Yeah, um, needless to say, I don't think uh, any of my movies really fun. Now, the question I was going to ask, with the Harry Moore scripts, are you planning on taking Harry in a different direction in film than you've sort of taken him in the books of the art? I think you have to. How are you sort of going to approach the fact that you've got him going on in the books of the art and right. doing one thing and doing something else in the movies? Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think what's going on in the, in the art books, which is, which is two, I should explain, Harry uh, appears in two large 700-page novels in which he does go his own splendid way through a whole series of adventures right across America. I don't see them as being mutually exclusive. I think there's time for him to have an adventure or two which we don't talk about in the art books. I think the only problem would be if you know, he was to lose a leg in one of the movies, you know, and, and I didn't mention it in the box. I think that would be a bit of a problem. But um, uh, I think that as long as there's not some huge sea change like that, I think you can probably get away with both. Um, as far as the direction is concerned, movies, the books are very metaphysical. They're full of ruminations about interdimensional beings and what form Jesus will take, and you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, the movies aren't. The movies can't be. The movies have to be entertainments which last two hours that, 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 that have a beginning, middle, and end, and, and with, a, with a very straightforward narrative line. And so the movies are always going to be slightly simpler than the books, and I say slightly, a lot simpler than the books. But I you think can that's have fine. certain complexity to Harry's character in the film. I mean, in the film Lord of Illusions, he's a much simpler character yes. than he is. Last illusion, or in either of the two for films. sure, and I think that part of that is part of that would be the pleasure of actually making a series of movies. That, as I said before, I think you can develop the character make a little bit. Um, it is frightening how troubling audiences find complexity. Uh, uh, written, no, truly, it's extraordinary how you can see as you're sitting with all these. Trust me, this previous this pre preview experience is the worst. That's you why, sit there. That's why Strange Days bomb. That's why Blade Runner bombed the first time. You're right, right, exactly. They don't. Audiences don't want ambiguity. They don't want complexity, and you can feel it pass through the audience when you present something like that. You can feel a, a kind of universal. <laughs> I want to coin that, you know, just as the Buddhists have um, America has do. Good afternoon, Clive. Hi. I'd like to ask you, if ever you got stuck on a desert island, on your own, for a long time, which book, which book would you take with you and why? Any book from right across the world? Yeah, any book. Oh, I would take Moby Dick. Yeah. Moby Dick is the great American novel and is the single most influential book on the novel. Um, a terrible failure in its time, by the way. Horribly reviewed. And, and actually stopped Melville writing and the reviews were, were so bad. Um, uh, but Moby Dick is a book I go back to every 18 months, two years, to get courage. It's a book with immense courage. It's a book which is written by somebody who doesn't care what the rules are, who says, this is the story I want to tell, this is the way I want to tell it, here it is. And so I think it would definitely, uh, it would definitely be Moby Dick. And as a second, I'd certainly take the Bible, uh, which I have sitting beside me and I read and love and is full of really neat stuff and a lot of sex and violence. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us felt that you were badly treated by David Levin. Yeah. And oh. <laughs> oh, I would love to come into that. I'll tell you. Uh, I'll tell you what 
happened on that, which was really, uh, now where's Rob? Where's Rob? Yeah. Uh, did we miss Letterman the first time and then go back on? What happened? Yes. They ran out of time. They ran out of time the first time, then we went back on, we didn't get on at all? <laughs> was that the first visit or the second? Second. Okay, so it's worse than you think it is. Because the, the first, we were on tour, we were in Miami, we, we were in New York for I guess a Thursday showing. We didn't get on, uh, and then we had to go to Miami. We went down to Miami, we were in Miami doing press, and they said, you can come back on for that night. And I said, well, you've got to guarantee that we actually get to talk, uh, because I hate flying, and I've got to get up to Miami, and I've got to be back that night because there was more interviews the following morning, so we flew up from Miami, we got on Letterman, I did 30 fucking seconds, <laughs> got on the plane, went back down again, and you know, so, so we actually did, whatever it is, you know, six hours of flying to get on and do that stuff, and that was the second bite, the first time you didn't see me. And, what are you going to say about that, except find a little doll to stick pins in? <laughs> The truth is, when you make a very modestly budgeted picture like the Order of Illusions, you take whatever publicity chances you can, you take whatever options you can, you just get out there and you pedal the movie. And this was not an expensive movie, it was not aggressively attacked in terms of the publicity by United Artists, because they didn't have a lot of money in the movie, and so they didn't feel like they had to, they're probably going to make it all back on video in the next couple of weeks. So they were just putting us on the road, you know? And I was just, and I, I, know, I, know, I know that if I get on Letterman and get a chance to talk about the movie and you get to show a sighting to the movie, that's going to put a lot of behinds on seats. The trouble is that, so you, so you go to the rigmarole and the trouble is they know it. They know that you will go to the rigmarole. They've got you wrapped around your little, their little fingers because you're desperate to get the chance to speak to the audience and say, come see this movie. It's so frustrating. It really is. And you feel so damn powerless. You sit there and, you know, I, I get very nervous for TV shows. So you sit there, you know, in your little room, you know, having you powdered and painted and painted, and you, and you sit there and you go, oh, God, okay, I'm going to go on and go to the It's over. <laughs> yeah, it is so, it's just, it's probably like coitus interrupted. Say again? Yeah, five minutes. Five more minutes, okay. Hi. Hi. Actually, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Okay. I teach at a private Catholic college, and <laughs> I took one of the sisters that was in church. She's the um, chairperson of the philosophy and theology departments. I'm going to love this. <laughs> Actually, you are, to see this movie, and she liked it 100% more than I did. <laughs> I think I like that. Uh, no, 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 the microphone has to go back. Um, we haven't finished this debate yet. Um, so what's her name? Because I want to send her a letter for one thing. Yeah, what, what, what's her name? Sister Carol Marie Wilk. So uh, she's sitting there. What is she liking about the movie? I mean, what's she responding to in the movie? I think she was responding to the, the fact that the philosophy, the idea that the good and the evil and that the, the evil can be overcome. And she liked some of the, the, uh, the scenes between Scott and Dorothea. <laughs> Adults in a relationship are treated like adults in a relationship. Gosh, that is so great. I'm beginning to think I should just go and show this movie in none of these apartments. Yeah, that's a good question, I guess. Yes. Well, I have two kind of Okay, there you questions. go. One is um, I saw you at the Comic Con yeah. this yeah. summer. Yeah. And you talked about um, the MPAA and a scene that they told you had too much blood, and you told them to go back and look at it again, and it had none. Now that we've all seen the movie, can you tell us what scene that was? Yeah, actually there were two scenes which were problematic. 
Actually, there were three scenes where it says it well. They were pr problematical. Have you seen the director's yes, yeah. Okay. So there's three things which are now in, which were not in, which mm -hmm. are MPAA removals. Uh, in order through the movie, when the screws go in to mix his hair, the mask, the first spurt of blood was occasionally MPAA, the second and third were problematic. <laughs> So we put those back meticulously in the director's cut, so you know, you get to watch an extra turn on turn of the screw. Um, the, um, when Miller, the, the, the white supremacist punk who, who, is, who is Butterfield's sidekick, gets skewered by the, the, the magical device, um, this is a kind of interesting, interesting issue that the MPAA has. Um, they're fine with entrance wounds, but they're not fine with exits. <laughs> so, in, in the theatrical cut, you see it go in his front, but you don't see it come out his back. Shame, I hear you cry. <laughs> in the director's cut, you do. You get a nice little sort of gushing exit. <laughs> it's incredibly quick. And what, what's interesting is, you know, a lot of it, I think, is about perception. I don't think anybody is going to be uh, corrupted by the sight of the, you know, if they're going to be corrupted, they're going to be corrupted by seeing the movie, not by an extra five <laughs> seconds here or there. And the third section, the one which is problematical for them, was the cutting of Valentin's eye uh, by Butterfield, <laughs> uh, which is one of those scenes where people think there's a lot more going on than there actually is. And a lot of that is about how excellent the players are, how excellent the performers are. Uh, so that was, there were two that questions? Was, that was my first question. That's my other question is, um, when are we going to get any more children's books? I mean, I'm uh, finishing, thank you. I'm finishing up on, on the new book on sacrament now, and then I'll probably go and write another book for children. Though, I don't think of, curiously, I don't think of them as being quote unquote well, children's, children's books. Right. Um, um, I'm very passionate about moving people's imaginations. And sometimes that can be a dark adventure like World of Illusions, and sometimes like The Thief of Always, it can be a brighter. Sometimes it can be a kind of visionary uh, um, adventure like the art books. I'm passionate about writing for children because you're getting to people before, you're getting to minds before Pat Buchanan does. <laughs> Love it. You know, it's it's wonderful. I, I get these uh, classes now send me the let you know the teachers get the classes to send letters to me, and I have hundreds of letters from kids now, and some of them are just wonderful, just really great. Like you are quite a good writer, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's extraordinary. And I don't know how much of this is nature or nurture, but it does break down on gender lines. The boy is definitely like the scary and the violent bits, much more than the girls do. The boys over and over all over and over again, they like it when Kana comes in and chews people and you know, and the little girls say they like Lulu and it's it, it's fun and I want to be able to continue to make books. I mean I made a joke about Pat Buchanan, though it's not a joke, it's terrifying. But it's, uh, it's, it's, what's interesting to me is, is the fact that, that we have all these wonderful minds growing up out there and uh, all the signs are that they're going to grow up in a world which is going to be less imaginative and less giving to them than the, maybe the world in which I grew up or, or you grew up. And I would like to do what I can as a storyteller to just keep that imagination visible and available and accessible and alive. We should finish. Thank you very much. Thank you.